Colonel Chris Hodfield joins us now. Chris, welcome to the 6 o'clock show. Yes. How are you? I, I, I said this to you in the makeup room. There was such excitement here yesterday when we told people you were on the show. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm excited yeah. to be here talking. I'm excited about everything. All of, There's so, so much cool stuff going on. But uh, thanks for inviting me on. Well, yeah. speaking of exciting and amazing things going on, you just welcomed a new baby granddaughter into yes. the family, two weeks old. She's How is that. she doing? Congratulations. She's doing great. Thank you for asking. Yeah. That. You're right. That's the most exciting thing in my life right now. Yeah. I walked her around downtown Dublin today Aww. in the pram, and she's, she's, she's making her eyes work today so she wow. can focus on things and... She's just figuring it all out. She's just a little pink bundle. Only two, so weeks, oh, two weeks old? Uh, about two and a half, yeah. Oh, wow. just amazing. Just so tiny, seven pounds, but <laughs> lovely. Good size, good size. Yeah, <laughs> a keeper for sure. Yeah. That's to all the family. Um, as we all know, family time is so important. When you're up in space for months at a time, how do you communicate with all your loved ones back home? How does that work? Uh, during my first space flight, back before the internet, we didn't. Okay. Uh, I mean, you, maybe they would come into mission control and talk to you very briefly, but that was the only way. But now we have, it's complicated with onboard and connected through a geostationary satellite, but you can actually phone home. And my wife on her telephone had a thing that said space. And right. it would ring and it would say space. And she'd go, oh. And she'd, but because you're so far away, there's a long time lag. So I would say, hello. And she would, it sounds like a sales call. She'd wait and wait. Yes, oh, hello. But uh, I could talk to her every day. And then I had a video call with her once a week. So wow. it, it was like being on a long business. What trip. was it like for those times before the internet? What would be the longest time you'd go without speaking it's to someone? Hard. Oh, well, yeah. We would have people up for months and months at a time uh, where you, you couldn't, if you had a conversation, conversation it would be very sort of stilted and and not you know not at the right time of day so so uh that yeah that's a quite, much more lonely existence yeah but also quite worrying for your family who don't know what's happened they just got to gotta trust well. it all you know but it's just... more the other way around okay. yeah. you know because yeah. you're up there in, in a very public place and and working very hard and everything that happens sort of becomes public knowledge whereas your family could be running into problems i know and so my wife had to set up a completely sort of independent uh, structure without me, not counting on me, and how to run the family, how to run all the business, how to do everything. Mm -hmm. And so when I showed up after six months, it's a <laughs> knock on the door and sort of <laughs> delicately insert yes. myself back into the family. He's like, so you're back, are you? Yeah. <laughs> really, Chris? <laughs> some yeah, of us sorry. missed you while yes. you were gone. Yeah. Some, some. <laughs> well, speaking of space, you've collated all of your experience in space into your live show, which is happening this June in Dublin. Very exciting. Tell audiences what they can expect. Uh, it's going to be a really fun evening at Borgash. Uh, it's images of things, uh, parts of the world it, with the textures of the sun coming from a spaceship that's just unbelievable. Our planet is like this a gorgeous blue ornament hanging in, in the blackness of space. And it, it's this precious a scintillating jewel and the photographs that I've taken and other astronauts are taken. I'll, I'll show some of that. And then what the Webb telescope and the Hubble telescope are showing us, we're just discovering things about the whole universe. We found galaxies that were just uh, almost right after the Big Bang that we're starting to see the light from those. Wow. And then I'll talk about a lot of the fun and difficult and dangerous and unusual things that have happened during my space flights. We'll talk about what's going on right now with mm -hmm. the new rockets and we have a probe on its way to Europa, one of the watery worlds uh, that lives out in our solar system. Mm -hmm. There's just, we have a probe driving around on Mars looking for fossils right now. We'll talk about all of that and it's settling the moon. There's people going to the moon next February. Yeah. And so talking about what that means historically, I'll have question and answer with the audience. Uh, There'll be a guitar on stage, so I'll play a couple songs. It's a really fun evening. We've already sold out the first show, I think, at Board Gosh, and the second one has a few more tickets. And I'm, it's across the UK, Dublin, and then to Australia. So it's a lot of fun to do, sharing all of the amazing things I've had a chance to see. And stuff people see. have never seen before as well, which is which is great. Yeah, I think yeah. that's that's the fun part, mm -hmm. is the newness of it. Yeah. The, I mean, when I was born, no one had ever flown in space. To me, this is all still this great early rush of what's possible yeah. mm -hmm. and to be in the position to share it and sort of the ultimate show and tell mm. uh, is a real privilege. You mentioned guitar, which brings us to music. Is it true that your David Bowie cover video actually inspired directing superstar Christopher Nolan when he was making Interstellar? 
that's you. How did you know that? But um, part I do all the research <laughs> on the show. I work so hard. When, when I when I had recorded the song, then I, I floated around one day singing along with my recording so that I could have a video, and I thought it would be fun to go into. There's this big bulging window on the bottom of the space station, and I would go down in there with the world behind me, and I had a camera. But in order to be like we have bright lights in the studio, I had a light here and a light here, just so my yeah, We're right there. Are, yeah. So if you look closely, you can see the light that's right there next to my face. Yes. And that <laughs> shot right there with the earth properly lit in the background and my face lit when they were making Interstellar, the thing, and that's how we need Matt McConaughey to look while he's while he's doing this. And so they, they contacted me afterwards and said, hey, we, we stole how you looked, and hopefully that was okay. I thought it was a huge compliment, because oh I just made it up real time. Totally, One of yeah. the greatest films ever, so that's pretty, that's pretty major. <laughs> yeah, pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, <funny. laughs> We've just seen you there floating as you are in the International Space Station. So we got to pick your brains about a couple of things, like how one lives in space. For example, how do you exercise? Uh, well, you do have to exercise. Actually, if, if you were gonna live the rest of your life in space, then just take advantage of weightlessness. You could be the laziest human being ever. <laughs> you don't have to hold your head up. Your heart doesn't have to lift your blood. You could just become like a jellyfish up there. But if you have to do a spacewalk, mm -hmm. which is very physical, mm -hmm. or of course, when you eventually return to the gravity of Earth, you wanna be strong. And so we have exercise equipment. We have a, a stationary bicycle. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have a seat because you don't need a seat without oh, gravity. Yeah. Uh, and you can bicycle once around the world. And if you see here, there's a treadmill as well. Uh, but you need big uh, elastics, bungees to hold you down yeah. onto the treadmill. And then we have a, a resistive machine, like a, a Bowflex kind of idea that you can, because mm -hmm. you can't lift weights, obviously, if you're weightless. But And between those three, I, I actually got a little stronger and I lost a little fat and gained a little muscle, came back to earth kind of ripped, which was nice. <laughs> but, I bet your wife was happy then. Yeah, but, um, but I lost bone because there's just no way to, to load up your, your bones so that they stay dense. Mm -hmm. I lost about 8% of the bone across my hip and upper wow. femur. Yeah. Pretty bad osteoporosis. And it takes a while to, to recover with the constant loading of gravity. Is there like an immediate, um, sort of like a physical adjustment that you need when you when you go from space back to Earth, like yeah, how long the, does the that The thing take? that is the word, you know, when you've gotten off a, a, a spinning ride mm -hmm. at a fair yeah. or something, mm -hmm. what's happening there is your, your balance system is still spinning from the ride, but your eyes are saying, hey, you're just standing here next to the ride. And when your eyes and your balance system disagree, yeah. you throw up because your body thinks you ate some neurotoxin. And so when you get back, you throw up because mm -hmm. your body's so confused about yeah. gravity. You're trying to smile for the camera, but you know, <laughs> any second now I'm going to throw up. Sounds like Chris is but, used to this. Yeah. But <laughs> after a few days, then uh, your body says, okay, back to the new normal. And you settle down and you get your balance back. And within about two weeks, I'll let you drive a car. And so you're, you're sort of back to normal. But the bone density, that takes like three to one. So if you're six months up, 18 months to get your bone density back. It's quite serious. It's almost like his version of jet lag in a way. Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah serious yeah. jet lag. Well, Chris, you're accredited for bringing space and the work of astronauts to the masses for the last few years, you know, through public speaking, through your work. How important is that to you? Imagine uh, if you had just spent six months off the Earth and your, your spaceship comes down through the atmosphere and the parachute opens and you bang into the world and roll to a stop and you climb out all wobbly, what would you do with this huge experience that you've just had? You know, you could, and some astronauts just keep it to themselves. Yeah. You know, that was, or some just share it with their families. Mm. But what hugely influenced me as a child was the, the American Apollo program that talked about what they were doing. And it, it challenged me as a kid to make the absolute most of myself. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of see it as a continuing obligation. I've been so lucky to fly on behalf of Canada in space three times yeah. to try and, and let other people see what's possible. If they don't know it exists, they can't make it part of their life. Mm -hmm. They can't make any choices. And so I think it's, it's a continuing joy, but also an obligation to share this experience as completely as I can so that other people perhaps can make a more informed choice with what they wanna do within their lives. Um, you really do it all. You've also got a new book that's about to come out. Yeah. Tell us all about Final Orbit. So I, I, I've written six books, uh, but I write thriller fiction. The Apollo Murders series, this is the third mm -hmm. in the series, and uh, it came out great. Like, I've, my, the people, the first folks that have read Final Orbit are just giving it 
rave reviews, which is an author. You toil away for two years on yeah. something, and suddenly you kind of go, I hope you like this. Mm -hmm. And to have people say, wow, this is the best book you've ever written, it's really delightful. And it's, it's thriller fiction, fiction, alternative history fiction set in 1975, and the story just rocks. It you really came along well. You said the word fiction, but are some of these characters based on real people? Oh, yeah, because it's alternative history, mm -hmm. uh, probably 90% of everything in the book happened with, and real people. You'll recognize almost every character in the book because they were real people, you know, presidents and, and leaders of countries and, mm. and, you know, some other famous people. But uh, that makes it really fun. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm making a jigsaw puzzle where most of the pieces are laid out, but I get some freestyle pieces and I get to, to weave my plot in amongst the reality of what happened. And, and there's this big clamoring. What my two lead characters are, are a guy named Kaz and a woman named Svetlana. And, uh, and what's going to happen with Kaz and Svetlana next? And I'm really delighted with how the story came out. I'm, I, I'm kind of impatient now for October when the book comes out because yeah. I want people, I want people to be able <laughs> to, to read it. People's you know? yeah. reaction. Yeah, it's I sense romance for them, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Is there an undertone of romance? Uh, you're going to have to wait for the book. Oh, we're going to have to read it, Brian. Exclusive we're here, have to exclusive read it. here. Well, while we have you here, we, of course, wanted to give a mention to the work that's being done here in Ireland, you know, by the Irish uh, when it comes to the space race. Recently, we had Nora Patton on, yes. friend of the show. How encouraging is that for Irish students that are studying in that space? Well, when, when I decided to be an astronaut as a young Canadian, we had no astronauts, no NASA, no space program, no rockets. But I thought the only thing I can really count on is that things are going to change. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I really control is myself yep. and the choices that I make. Mm -hmm. And I thought the best thing I can do is just get ready, mm -hmm. like Nora is, mm -hmm. and just change my own skill set and see what happens in the world. Mm -hmm. And incredibly enough, I've, I've flown in space three times and commanded a spaceship and done spacewalks. And so, uh, it's easy to say, well, that doesn't exist in my country and therefore there's no point in me even trying. That's giving up on your dreams doesn't come for free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a cost to that. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's so important to keep dreams close to your heart and constantly be making decisions that moves you closer to the person that you want to be or the things that you want to have Put in your life in. for real. Yeah. And there, there was a measurable change here in Ireland after my third space flight. Uh, of young people that chose to study physics and maths in school, it was it was it was discussed within the government at the time of, wow, 15% more people, uh, young people have now chosen uh, to go and study science and maths just purely because of realizing this might be possible yeah. within their well, life. If you see it, you can be it. Uh, thank that's you so true. much for joining us. Thank you. I want pleasure. to know what he thinks about Katy Perry going to space. Well, you're staying for the whole show, yeah, so we'll we can chat about that. Later. I want to know. He's laughing, so we'll find out. <laughs> Give it up for Chris Hadfield. Yes, thank what you. About him? You can see Chris Hadfield in his show, Chris Hadfield, A Journey into the Cosmos. It is on in the Board Gosh Energy Theatre on the 15th of June. Tickets are available on the Board Gosh website. Plus, Chris's book, Final Orbit, is available for pre-order right now.